Hey everyone, welcome back to another Fantasy Auto Lounge. This month we are joined by none other than Mr. Anthony Ryan. How are you doing, Anthony? Great to have you here. Hi, I'm great. Thank, thanks for asking me. I wanted to get you on the lounge for ages just because, I mean, yeah, you're one of, I would say, one of the first people to come to mind when you talk about Epic Fantasy. And uh, yeah, let's start off with uh, telling everyone who's watching about yourself, um, how you started out with uh, writing and your many best selling books. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm Anthony Ryan, I'm the uh, author of the Raven Shadow trilogy, the Draconis Memoria, uh, the uh, recently begun uh, Covenant of Steel, and uh, the Slap City Blues science fiction series, and the Seven Swords novella series. Uh, I was first published with uh, Blood Song, which is the first in the Raven Shadow trilogy. Uh, which was originally uh, self-published and then got picked up by uh, Ace. Uh, and uh, I've been sort of mainly traditionally published since then, but I also uh, do put out the occasional self-published uh, novella or, you know, short story or something. Uh, so technically I'm a hybrid, mainly, uh, you know, uh, traditionally published these days. Mm. That's great. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's one of the things I was going to kind of touch on because in my mind, you're also one of the original indies back in like 2009, 2010 and, and so on. And, and yeah, obviously one of the first people to come hybrid as well, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> been quite yeah. a journey. Yeah. I mean, I was sort of lured out of self-publishing relatively quickly, you know, I didn't, I didn't do it for very long as a serious thing. It was you know, a period of months after Wow. <laughs> uh, blood started taking off, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I was quite, a, I think, quite fortunate in that regard. Uh, and there was this feeling at the time that uh, this is how people get a publishing deal from now on. You know, they don't need to bother querying agents. You can just put up a book on the Kindle store and exactly. get a publishing contract. <laughs> yeah. It didn't, didn't happen that way. The, you know, the agents were drowning in submissions long before I came along or people like you, Harry, or uh, Amanda Hawking came along mm -hmm. and agents are still drowning in submissions now. So it's, you know, that <laughs> aspect of it hasn't changed. I think it's just created another, another avenue to success for, for writers. But it, mm. as I'm sure you, you know better than I do, there's no guarantees to success. Ooh, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. it, and it's, I'd have to say with self-publishing, it seems to be getting harder. It does, uh, yeah. Getting used and everything. Yeah. So uh, yeah. maybe one day I'll go back to it full time. You know, <laughs> kind of content where I am for the moment. Yeah, of course. Well, it sounds like a great position to be in. <laughs> and uh, I mean, like you're absolutely right. There is uh, no guarantees of success. It's just a lot of hard work. I think even though the tools have got easier and uh, the platforms more standardized, maybe it is still down to your book and you and your yeah. marketing and all that sort of stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Remember what it was like trying to convert a word file into an ebook back in 2011. It was yeah, <laughs> this nightmarish kind of thing. You didn't know HTML. He was, oh God. Oh no, that was yeah, that was me. I remember just sitting on what was it Caliber or Caliber. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I always get confused. Am I, am I thinking of the non-alcoholic beer? <laughs> just like getting that stuck in my head. Uh, but yeah, Caliber and spending I don't know how many days I must have spent on Caliber and just swearing at it and my own technical ineptitude at the same time. <laughs> oh dear. But yeah, things have changed. But um, it's still all about the books, isn't it? On that note, then, you've just brought out a brand new book, start a brand new fantasy series, The Pariah. Uh, I've got my copy. I've just dug into it. And that first scene is, is fantastic. A, a <laughs> remarkable coincidence. There it is. <laughs> oh, mine's oh, in all good bookshops now. That's uh, it. Yeah, it looks good in hardback as well, actually. I got the paperback. Yeah. Well, tell us about it. <laughs> well, it's what I called when I was pitching it to my agent and my Publishers are called it my unashamed cod medieval fantasy. Because um, <laughs> the Raven Shadow series, I mean, a lot of people think of it as a medieval fantasy, but really it's sort of late medieval, early Renaissance in terms of the period, you know, or the period I stole from history to set it. 
the pariah is much more in the middle of a mid med genuine medieval period with all the, you know, the uh, what we would term dystopian elements that come along with it. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a feudal society. It's, uh, you know, you know, fine if you're at the top of the society and really terrible if you, you're at the bottom. And I was, in terms of the narrative, because it's a first person narrative, it's, you know, it's all through one uh, character's point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to start someone at the lowest rung of society. I mean, he's not even a peasant. He's not even a churl. Mm -hmm. He's below them. He's an outlaw. So, you know, he's uh, now that, that does reflect the reality of what medieval society was like. Because mm -hmm. uh, you could be lowest, lower than the low <laughs> to the point where you're not even recognized as existing in law. Because mm -hmm. if, you, if you weren't a peasant, you weren't, you know, the, as far as landowners were concerned, you didn't exist. You know, as far as the church was church concerned, you're not a parishioner, you don't exist. Mm. Uh, so they will leave you to starve, and they did just leave people to starve. You were not, you just didn't fit into a, mm. you know, part of society. Mm. Uh, so it's hardly surprising that a lot of them ended up as, as outlaws. And I wanted to start someone at that level and see how far he could go and maybe how far he could rise. Uh, but something I did, something that came out of my research was uh, the, at all levels of a medieval society, no one was really safe. Mm. Uh, not from the plague or from, from what we call, we call crime, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and wars, you know, uh, and assassination, and you know, a lot of things that we think of being quite modern mm. uh, were, in fact, you know, they were doing them all then, and, and mm. religious conflict and all that, everything else that comes along. Uh, so you're probably less likely to die by sickness or violent death if you are in the nobility, but not that much more. Mm. You know, you weren't that much safer. Uh, you know, you, you, they could still get you even if you were a king. Yeah. Plenty of kings died fairly horrible deaths. I mean, uh, Absolutely. Look up the, the death of Edward II, for an example. If it's true, that story might not actually be true about the red hot poker. But, uh, you know, yes. it's, yeah. it's an example of how cruel they could be, even if it isn't true. Mm. So, yeah. And, you know, as, as it's fantasy, there is magic in it, but it's uh, deliberately low-key magic. There's no wizards levelling whole cities or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, I deliberately kept the magic uh, not muted. It's present, it's there, but it's mm -hmm. not all-conquering. It's not the answer to every plot point, you know, which mm -hmm. can happen in fantasy a lot of the time. <laughs> Guilty of that myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, that's in you know, we'll, one of the starting points for in terms of inspiration was the story of Joan of Arc. Even though Joan, the Joan of Arc type character is not the main character in it, but there's a you know a character in it who fits that kind of archetype. And I've always been curious as to what would have happened if Joan of Arc had lived. If she hadn't been burnt at the stake, what mm. would have happened? And it's possible we might, instead of thinking of her as this kind of saintly, mm -hmm. you know, self-sacrificing figure, I mean, in time we might have thought of her as a monster, because if she had lived, there probably wouldn't have been any stopping her. She would probably have taken over France and much of Europe. Wow. Yeah. As That's far as people at the time were con concerned, she was a living saint. She was really... Mm blessed by God, and they had incontrovertible proof of that. Mm. So there, there would have been no stopping her, and she might have ended up one of the worst tyrants in history, I mean, you know. Wow. So yeah, that, that was kind of the, you know, one of the starting points for it. Had a, a lot of different, as, as ever with inspiration, and mm. I don't know if you find this, but it's a lot of different things that come together. It's mm. not just one thing, you know. 100%. So, yeah. yeah, I always find things cobbled together. It's always like, little spark here, little spark there, and you suddenly realize, ah, these two could go yeah. together. <laughs> so going back through your uh, like writing ideas and things like that.
I mean, are you one of these authors that if anything comes to you, it immediately goes in a notes document or a book or anything like that, and um, just will stay locked in the in the mind trap? <laughs> sometimes I will write them down. Sometimes, but I found a lot of this when I go back to the story ideas file. A lot of them have they just sit there and I've never done anything with them. Some of them I have, but mostly not. Mm. It's the ones that I just leave to percolate you know the ones that i just i tend to think if it's a good idea it'll come back yeah, it'll grow exactly. you know it'll build mm. uh without any help from me they, you know and I'm, I'm never sure of ideas and they're always you know coming up that's great so yeah i tend to think if it's a good idea it'll <laughs> like, like a, bit, a bit of darwinism it'll uh yeah. <laughs> just kill off all it'll your survival of the fit. Yeah. that's the thing yes yeah, survival of the fittest indeed i mean I, I quite like that idea of ideas killing off other ideas actually within your mind <laughs> that's well, they, and they absorb yeah. sometimes they absorb each other you know it's, yes they, may, they merge you know mm. you've got an idea for one thing and something you think might be totally separate mm. and sometimes they come together you know and so in terms of that i mean that's probably why you've got quite uh, a, a large backlist in, in terms of books and novellas you've written as well, but also quite a varied backlist because you're about to bring out another novella. Is it tomorrow? Is it the 30th tomorrow? Yeah. Or whenever this goes uh, out on the 30th of September? Uh, the new the e City of Songs? Yeah. The ebook and uh, audio book of City of Songs, which is the uh, uh, next in the series of the Seven Swords novellas. So it'll be out um, tomorrow. Hopefully, there might be some issues with Amazon if you get your ebooks off Amazon. Some might want to look elsewhere for it because there's been some bloody thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, right? But, uh, love them and hate them at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, the hardcover, it, because it's published by Subterranean Press, they're, uh, mm. you know, they're a specialist seller of, uh, you know, hardcovers, mm. limited edition hardcover. And that started shipping a few days ago. So if you ordered awesome. it, you probably probably have a copy by now. Looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that series then, because that's something you're still self-publishing, isn't it? But well, in part, obviously, with Subterranean. It's a kind of very long quest story about, uh, a, you know, as we, when we meet in the first volume, we don't really know who the mm. central protagonist is. It's only gradually revealed. It's, it's a, suffice to say he's a, very dangerous man with a sword that's inhabited by a demon that is constantly taunting him. Uh, and he's got a very dark and checkered past and he's in search of these seven swords, all of it, each one of which is inhabited by a different demon. Because he thinks if he, he can bring them all together, then he'll be free of the demon that's in his sword. Uh, at least that's how it starts, you know. So, and they're, they're all scattered all over the world, so he has to to find them, he has to uh, go to various places and have various adventures and so on. That's awesome. yeah. Each one is a kind of tribute to my favourite tropes. You know, the first one is a sort of Ray Harryhausen monster fest, you know. Right. And the second one is, uh, you know, like an Indiana Jones sort of dungeon death trap, you know, That's kind cool. of adventure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the City of Songs is a, basically a locked room murder mystery. Hmm. Uh, so each one will have a sort of different approach to storytelling. Well, whilst hitting a lot of the standard tropes of sword and sorcery, because hmm. it's, it's more in the vein of sword and sorcery, like Robert E. Howard or Fritz Lieber than it is, you know, epic fantasy. So, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. That's like, I mean, like I said, can't be a good good quest or something. I mean I'm fascinated by that and I like the, the variety as well because I don't know I mean I struggle to not tell the same story all the time <laughs> you know, to, between once you get to you know, a couple of books it's it's like I've got to make this difference somehow so yeah <laughs> that's a good way to do it uh, are those would you say those are your favorite tropes then or we have we got kind of like a guilty pleasure trope in fantasy either writing or reading yeah I don't, I'm talking of things you try I try to avoid I mean the uh, I don't actually don't mind the tropes as a reader. Uh, I think that, to be honest, readers are coming back for the tropes. I think that's what they like. Yeah. Uh, so I don't mind them as long as you can put a different spin on them, as long as you're not just... And your different spin should come in the form of character and story mm. uh, instead of just, you know, 
doing Lord of the Rings with the serial numbers filed off, you know, <laughs> or taking your D and D, your favorite D and D campaign, and deciding it's going to be a good novel and tip for you if you do that. It won't. It won't work. <laughs> people advice. endlessly crapsing up and down tunnels does not make for a good yeah, a good novel. <laughs> but I see it in certain certain things from time to time. Mm. Uh, well, yeah, one uh, trying to consciously avoid is the chosen one narrative, because uh, I think that's a bit overplayed. Uh, and it, you know, there's a lot of classic books that used it, but I think it can, you know, people, people have seen, definitely seen that one before. You know. Yeah, 100%. Well, I mean, with a varied backlist, like we said about yours, um, you know, it's kind of, it's hard to do, like, fit all of this into this discussion. And, you know, as much as I'd love to, and the, and the viewers would love to just discuss each and every book of yours, we'll probably have to do multiple lounges, I think, <laughs> to get that done. Um, but, you know, what would you say your kind of trademarks are in terms of your, um, I mean, yeah, because you've gone through different genres and things like that, quite a, quite a variety of genres. So what is something that you find creeping into every one of your books? So, for example, for me, it's always an anti-religious kind of uh, or anti-organized religious theme that <laughs> always sneaks in. Religious people are always the bad guys. There's always an evil cult. So, yeah, what yeah. are these sort of like Anthony Ryan trademarks that uh, sneak into your books? Uh, religion is another one for me as well, but... Uh... Uh, I'm not a message writer, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not always critiquing religion, it's more that I'm just setting out, you know, what I think are the key elements in religious conflict and it kind of, it's up to the reader to decide if you think this is a good thing or a bad thing, you know. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, yeah, I like, if I have trademarks and maybe my own conceit, I like to think it's, uh, an intelligent approach to action. My work tends to be action focused. Mm -hmm. uh, and but I like to approach it from an intelligent point of view rather than, you know, just find an excuse to have another sword fight every few pages, you know. It's, yeah. There has to be a reason for it and it has to advance the plot, you know. And it can't just be a, a cool new way for people to kill each other. You know, there has to be some, <laughs> some deeper thing to it, you know. Yeah. At least that's how I see it. <laughs> that's it. The intentions are there. <laughs> yeah, it's the thing. I'm I'm not a, a message writer. I mean, things have probably snuck in through my own uh, personality and things like that and viewpoints. But I find that it's, um, I don't know, it's more of escapism for me, fantasy, as a reader, personally. And it's, you know, <laughs> don't want to be yeah. bogging down in the same sort of socio-political things that are uh, going on in the in the world around us <laughs> too much but uh, no, i don't think there's anything wrong in escapism especially exactly. these days uh, mm -hmm. like more of it please <laughs> yeah absolutely as a as a person obviously with a strong knowledge of history which we've already seen but you've also i understand you've got a degree in history as well um which is fascinating yeah. i love that it's one of the degrees i would love to have <laughs> if i had the time to study and maybe the, the mind probably um but in terms of that what is your maybe not favorites kind of a, a reductive word but in terms of uh the historical periods or settings that you go to uh what's some of your kind of your favorites there <laughs> um even though i haven't written about it very much uh i think the the Enlightenment period and on is endlessly fascinating because it represents a switch. Mm. You know, it represents what the, the name is on the tin, the Enlightenment. But you get this weird dichotomy when people like Isaac Newton are around, mm. uh, you know, divining gravity and so on. But <laughs> at the same time, Isaac Newton was a massive crank. He was a... I believed in astrology, he believed in demonology, he was, uh, right. wanted to burn Catholics at the stake. He was a pretty terrible human being, actually. Right. And, uh, but yeah, and uh, an occultist uh, and a bit of a nutcase right. in many respects. Uh, but in, the, in his day, he was, just, he was the pinnacle of science. He was the pinnacle mm. of rationality. Right. And he wasn't <laughs> being a bit of a nutcase and believing all this other weird crap. Uh, he wasn't in any way unusual. Uh, everyone believed it, you know. Mm. If you tried to tell people then there's no such thing as wit witches, uh, they'd laugh at you, 
course it's witchy. We, we burned 500 of them last week. They must be real. <laughs> you know. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's a really fascinating paradox, I think, the Enlightenment, where you get this burgeoning rationality alongside total superstition, you know. Mm. Uh, but if you take a broad view of history, even though yeah, we have difficulties in the modern world, uh, you compare it to even 100 years ago, mm. I'd r much rather be here than that. And that's yes. true of every other period of history, because mm. the further back you go, the, the, the worse your chances of living through infancy to adulthood, you know. Right. Yeah. There's never been, a, frankly, a better time to be alive, at least in the Western world. And, yeah, it doesn't seem like it for, for a lot of the time. <laughs> that we're only seeing it through our own eyes. You know? That's it, yeah. Take someone from 100 years ago to today, they think we're living in some kind of magical wonderland. You know? Exactly, yeah. Especially, yeah, with all the technology and saying, yeah, we're going to Mars soon, that just it would blow people's mind, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I always think it's um, it's not just history moving, but civilization in general, but kind of maybe undulating a little bit here and there, in and out of... It's, it's, it's never a straight line. Yeah. And so, yeah, going back to your books in terms of, you know, the, talking about the variety and different genres that you've written in and still write in, what's, uh, what's been the kind of the most fun? Again, not going to force you to pick a favorite mm. <laughs> or say, yeah, this is my favorite book. But in terms of the settings, which has been the maybe the most fun you've had as a writer? Probably the Draconis Memoria. Um, in a weird way, even though it's a sort of cold Victorian industrialized world, it, uh, there's a lot of freedom in it. You know, mm. so I could just make stuff up from the ground up because they, Brilliant. you know, it's not, in a weird way, you know, writing in a medieval world is kind of constraining because, mm. yeah, even if they're wrong, people think they know what a medieval world looked like and sounded like and everything. Uh, when it's more familiar, uh, actually, you can play with it more. You can put a twist on it because mm. you don't have to do the heavy, heavy lifting of, explaining how a steam engine works. Most people will, they know a steam engine does this. Uh, so, you know, you get, there's a certain amount of freedom with it. Uh, so yeah, the Cornish Memorial is probably the most fun world to create. Uh, in terms of the most, I don't know if you could call it fun, but writing Tower Lord, which is my, the sequel to Blood Song, mm -hmm. certainly the most dynamic writing experience. Uh, it was, Kind of all encompassing because it was I had a day job at the time and I was mm. writing every spare hour I could grab. You know, mm. I had to write two thousand words a day for six months in order yeah. to get it done because I was under contract by then. And, you know, I had to deliver it. Um, you know, and I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't feel I had the luxury of taking five years to write the sequel to my best-selling first book, <laughs> uh, much as I would have liked it. But, uh, <laughs> but it, was a, it was a very, you know, dynamic experience. It was, you know, because I was younger then, I guess. I'm not sure I could do it now. Mm. Uh, but yeah, that was just, just, just the sheer sort of absorption of it. Uh, kind of, right. I kind of liked that even though it was, looking back, quite stressful. But hmm. Still finished it in the end. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> we are much happier for it. Was it, in fact, that pressure, because I'm, uh, <laughs> this is the first year I'm kind of experiencing sort of, well, one of the first years I'm experiencing a bit of deadline pressure and contractual pressure. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it's interesting. Did you find, I mean, yeah, talking about that that stressful kind of, that period, it, was it the contractual kind of obligations of it? Was it the fan pressure? Or was it just kind of, I need to get this done ASAP for your own, <laughs> your own sanity? Uh, kind of all of them, to be honest. Uh, I think but the, the overriding one was the fact that I'd now had a legally binding piece of paper that told me I had to do it. Uh, yeah, no, because, of, you know, we've been trying to get published for so long and finally here I was with a publishing contract. I didn't want to muck it up, you know, I didn't want to go and beg them for an extension to the deadline. They probably would have given me one. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I did want to do it. And I did, as a challenge to myself, um, 
writing a book of that length and trying to get it done within the space of a year. Mm. Uh, you know, it's a long book. It's one of the long, long, long book. books, Tower Lord. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. So from that sort of point of view, I did. That's one of the reasons why, I guess. Uh, mm. Yeah. That's but, great. That's a good commitment. Yeah. yeah. If you're self-employed, you have to be a harsh boss. I found that you can't. You know, much as you might want to give yourself the day off and go and sit on the PlayStation all day. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, when you're your own boss and you're paying your own bills and you can't call in sick, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a bit of a mind focuser. It is. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> it's difficult. I remember when I made the switch about like five, six years ago now uh, to go full time. My thing was like I'd have to I'd have to do the day exactly as if I was going to work. So I'd get up at a certain time, you know, as, heading into the office for like nine or something like that. You know, I couldn't just laze around. Or I did for a couple of weeks, just lazing around, just you know, so you having a shower, but just sitting in your uh, <laughs> sitting in just your comfies or something like that. And I just found myself my productivity sort of doing that after a while. And I had to, yeah, as you said, be a harsh boss because that's been roughly almost ten years for you now, isn't it, since you've gone full time? Or is it? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's weird. <laughs> I still get the odd dream when I'm back in the office. Oh, really? <laughs> I wouldn't say it's a nightmare, but it's... <laughs> back, in, back in the office. And uh, the writing career hasn't gone well, so I've had to go back. That, that's oh, the no. dream. Uh, and everyone feels, you know, they're sympathetic. They feel sorry for me. All these people who don't even work in the place that I used to work, they've all moved on since. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, in my dream, they're all still there, you know, <laughs> waiting for me to come back. And of course they're not. Yeah. It's a strange feeling. But it, you yeah. know, as time goes on, and you know, I don't feel that way. I feel that way less and less. You know. mm. This is kind of my, my normal now, you know. This is you, yeah. I think it's strange though, isn't it? Because I don't know if it's imposter syndrome, but I get the same feeling of just like, is this actually like, is this, have I done this? Is it real? Is it what I want? <laughs> As in, like, have I done it? it? Feels kind of a bit fragile, but uh, yeah, it's probably the the creative in us, right? I think. <laughs> and uh, I think every writer gets imposter syndrome. There's a mm. twin malaise of imposter syndrome and uh, what's, what's the other one? Uh, professional envy, I guess, is one. Even though we don't talk about it much, but yeah, we all know. <laughs> just quietly, uh, yeah, just behind our own screens, just like, I'm so happy for you, but why isn't that me? <laughs> it's human nature. I mean, I am genuinely happy for people who do well, but it doesn't stop me being envious. You know? No, exactly. Yeah. So I always say there's no real, like, necessary need competition between, uh, yeah, we're not in our genre, especially. No. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of readers, <laughs> plenty of people rereading books, there's plenty of space for everyone. And it's, you know, the, that's why I think, you know, the community, this comes up at time and time again in the lounges, um, just, you know, one of the best things about being an author or being in this kind of, you know, modern uh, market is just the community, you know, just the fact that we can chat together all, all day, every day on Twitter, probably to the uh, sacrifice of our word counts <laughs> sometimes. Um, but yeah, I think it's fantastic. So let's talk about your writing kind of process then without, you know, obviously going into um, yeah, line by line sort of processes. Um, but what's your kind of usual creative process uh, or even writing process, you know, day to day, you sort of, you know, do you roam <laughs> from cafe yeah. to cafe or pub to pub? Do you yeah. stay in your office? Uh, what's, um, your, yeah, what's your process? Um, I have my own study, which I'm sitting in now, uh, and I don't write anywhere else these days. I have in the past. Uh, yeah. I have to, you can probably write anywhere for put the headphones on and whatever, I've written on trains and planes and so on. Mm. Uh, but I do much prefer to be at home and mm. writing. Um, I mean, I outline my work, uh, but I look at the outline intermittently. I do a chapter by chapter outline. And I know that, you know, I average about 4,000 words per chapter, so. The number of chapters in the outline will tell me how long the book's going to be, but mm. um, no, it's not always that accurate. But, you know, it gives me a rough idea how long it needs to be and the overall shape of the story. But when I, during the actual writing, I don't look at the outline that much. Mm. Uh, you know, once it, once I get going, once it takes on its own momentum, 
I can say it, momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, it just kind of flows, you know, not you know, not always easily, but it does, you know. Mm. Once once the story's in my head, I don't do a lot of pondering on it. Uh, That's quite cool. Yeah, and in terms of the actual day-to-day -day writing, what I've been doing my last two projects is uh, I tell Scrivener, I write in Scrivener, mm -hmm. I tell it when I need to finish, I tell it how many words it needs to be, and it tells me how many words I need to write a day. That's good. And I've, I've been experimenting with just sticking to that. Mm -hmm. And I find it a lot less stressful and, mm -hmm. you know, a good way of making progress. I mean, it, you're writing a, you know, 150 or 200,000 word epic fantasy novel. Uh, if I tend to think it's like looking, trying to start climbing a mountain and just looking at the top of the mountain the whole time. Yeah, if you're going to climb the mountain, you have to look at the climb in front of you on that day, not the top of the mountain. Otherwise, you'll never get there. Because it's a, you know, it's, it's a huge feat when you think about it. It's a lot of work to do. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you want to, if you want to meet your deadlines, uh, you know, you have to go with some method of working that works mm. for you. But I think we're all different. Every, everybody's different. Uh, I'm not someone who can write 5,000 words a day or anything like that. I just, mm. I've done that a few times, but it's not comfortable. Yeah. Do you find it comes becomes more like work than uh, maybe the, the joy <laughs> that seems to be still part of your writing? Yeah. But I find it regardless of, how many words I do a day, whether I have to force myself to do more because I'm running up against the deadline or, mm. uh, you know, if I only do 500 that day, um, the quality doesn't seem to change that much. Um, uh, because I, I rewrite, come the next day, I will rewrite what I wrote the day before. So it tends to keep the quality up rather than just having, if I didn't do that, I'd have, you know, a fairly large manuscript that needed a lot of work <laughs> so yeah. that's quite good yeah in terms of editing the chapter or a chunk of a chapter before writing actually i find that quite sometimes i need to do that it's not something i it's just not a habit um but yeah I, i've spoken to yeah a lot of authors including yourself that do that and i think it's actually the times that i've done it it just gets you back into the mindset because sometimes i don't know about you but i just leave it in the middle of a sentence <laughs> I'm just, i've done that yeah. so for the day yeah and i'll just come back to it and it's it's more just I don't know how to finish the sentence. Rather, I'm going to tease my tomorrow self with a, a way to get back into it. So in terms of obviously that's your writing and, and creative process, um, as a reader, do you still find yourself kind of, are you one of these authors that can't read while you're writing? I'm, all, I'm always reading. Um, I will probably not read epic fantasy while I'm writing epic fantasy, mm. unless it's the kind of epic fantasy that I don't write. Right, because uh, I don't want the you know you get this unconscious echoing that goes on. When, you know, yeah. you're not even aware of reading something, and suddenly it's in your book, and you know, oh bloody hell! <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's something I don't do. But I do read fantasy whilst mm. I'm writing. You know, I mean? but I read across genres. I read crime. I read uh, science fiction. You know, that's great. Uh, and I read a lot non-fiction. I've, I've got, usually got a an audio book, uh, a fiction book, and uh, a history book or non-fiction on the go at the one time. Amazing. <laughs> uh, so, um, it's a way to increase your your input, I think, as a reader. That's cool, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. That's great. What are you reading at the moment, then? Anything interesting? I'm reading the third in Ed McDonald's Black Wing series. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great series, which I, I heartily recommend. Uh, I think he just announced he's got another series starting next year. So yes, he does. Yeah, I've so already begged him for, for an arc for that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's he's a very good writer, and uh, I like with him. I like the inventiveness of his his world building. It's totally different from anything else, you know. Mm, that's awesome. uh, but very dark and quite brutal in places. But uh, you know, I, I like the difference of it and the weirdness of it. Mm. You can take something very weird, but still manage to make a fairly solid, incredible narrative out of it. Yeah. Mm. That's great. Yeah. So series is on my mountainous TBR. <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting around to it. Would it be, I tell you what, let's go for a, a fun question, challenging one. If you had to, 
let's say you found yourself stranded on a desert island or any island doesn't have to be des desert <laughs> uh what is your what are the three books you're going to take for company um probably wolf in shadow by david gemmell that's my favorite david gemmell book nice. which is weird because it seems to be most people's least favorite david gemmell book i don't know why uh, but it was the first of his I read, and uh, mm. I just remember being so totally blown away by it. Mm. It was just so good. Um, and, you know, you can take fairly simple, straightforward prose, but craft something that was so emotionally engaging, you know, and just so entertaining. And I love that. It's, yeah, it's a great, great book. Uh, book number two. <laughs> <laughs> the Use of Weapons by Ian M. Banks, I think. Okay. Uh, that's my favourite of the culture series. Mm. It's, it's probably the darkest of the whole series. And, uh, mm. Very complex, very very character driven, I think. Uh, that's it, yeah. That's what I like about it. He always had this sort of ability to, you know, reveal the twist. And there's, all, there's all, usually a twist in his book. Uh, and you know, a few writers, I think, uh, were as skillful as him in, in the reveal. You know, you could mm. gen generally not guess where it was going. That's good. Uh, yeah. Well, the balance of foreshadow and then at the same time, just like a twist you wouldn't see. Because that, yeah. that's one I haven't read yet. So, yeah, that's awesome. So that's your um, two. <laughs> well, I'm tempted to go really intellectual and pretentious with books for you and say something difficult like, <laughs> Ulysses or <laughs> Finnegan's Wake, but I think if I had them, I'd, I'd end up using them as kindling. <laughs> yes, uh, pages now. Yeah. I probably won't. Actually, if I'm on a desert island, I want some kind of survival guide. You know, some kind of handbook about how to do things. Because I'm not outdoorsy at all. And mm. Drop me in a desert island, I'll be starving within day. I'd eat <laughs> Wilson the uh, the volleyball. I'd eat it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to be worrying about him as your imaginary friend who's already been eating. <laughs> <laughs> I probably had to take something just gigantic, something fantasy that's just, I don't know, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've never read The Wheel of Time, so, yeah. Either have I. Uh, yeah. That would be a really long one today. <laughs> exactly. Well, Anthony, it's been honestly it's really fascinating to chat to you. And thank you so much. So, I mean, if anyone's watching and for some reason hasn't read your books, which is unbelievable, <laughs> uh, where can we find you? Uh, AnthonyRyan.net uh, is my website. Um, uh, writer underscore Anthony on uh, Twitter. Uh, Facebook, I can't remember. Uh, but, you know, I don't like Facebook anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Instagram. I think it's Anthony Ryan286, if I remember rightly, on Instagram. Uh, and yeah, I think that's all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. You're pretty easy to find. <laughs> Google <laughs> Google enjoys it. <laughs> but good stuff. Well, again, thank you so much. It's been great to chat to you. Great to have in the lounge. Great to Zoom meet you at the very least. <laughs> and hopefully, no yeah, be uh, catching you at a uh, conventional one of everyone back in the UK. We'll see. But awesome. Thank you so much. And um, yeah. Have a great rest of the day. Enjoy it. Cheers. Take care.